The best way to, to think about this is like in the real world, in the real life, you know, you don't want to be that shady character in a dark alley that we've seen in movies where you're like, hey, you want to buy a watch? You know, and to a lot of people, that's kind of what we're doing. We're like going in the middle of Times right. Square with a megaphone where to complete strangers and we're like say, hey, here's what I'm selling. This is what I'm selling. This is what I'm selling. And what do a lot of us do when we see those people in Times Square, we kind of like have a bubble and we walk. It's almost like a force field. We kind of like walk around. There's one or two people that are amazed and they're taking pictures like, wow, we don't get this at home. You know, but other than that, like <laughs> most of us walk around these type of people, right? Well, my next guest has been an entrepreneur all of his life, and he has built several multi-million dollar businesses. And he, like so many of us, have had their highs and low as an entrepreneur. And he documented his reinvention by being a contributor to entrepreneur.com. He really is, I can't even stress this enough, he is a marketing guru, and he is the co-founder and co-CEO of The Adaptive Method. And I want to welcome Paul Pruitt to this um, Entrepreneur Success Summit interview. Great. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I know that uh, you had the other co-CEO, which really is is my wife, Melissa. Uh, and um, I have to say she's the backbone and runs the company. I, I just get a chance to to be able to share my knowledge and expertise that I've had over the years. I've, I've been self-employed my entire adult life, never worked for anybody else. So I'm a kind of an odd little, little one. That's uh, amazing though, really. And yes, we had Melissa who I adore Melissa. She knocked it out of the park. Um, but that's actually, I didn't know that, that you have not been employed by anybody else. That's really interesting. Yes. Yeah, so 15, 16 years old when I was younger, you know, under 18, you know, I, I did work in, in different capacities, but uh, you know, 18 and older, I've never worked for, for another human being. So I've always been self-employed entrepreneur. Yeah, that's really the definition of an entrepreneur right then and there. So I want to jump into a couple topics here. So the first one is messaging because so many of us, we have this product that we are so excited to sell and we put it out there without really thinking too much about it. And then it's crickets. So how can you help us understand messaging and the importance of messaging things at the right time, perhaps? Yeah. You know, this is a really interesting com conversation we're going to have here because I think a lot of us, when we, when we're in the real world, we have a lot of social cues, things that we picked up on in our life experiences. And then when we get online, we, we throw out a lot of the things that we learned in our lives. And we just see a screen, we see ones and zeros, we see followers, we see, you know, account on our email list. And we, we, in a way we instantly like think like, Hey, I love my thing. Everybody that I've collected <laughs> along the way must love the thing equally. And they're, they woke up this morning thinking about what I'm offering and they just want to buy it. And, and the reality is, is that we have to take a step back, look at social cues and the best, there's more advanced ways of saying this, but like the best way to, to think about this is like in the real world, in the real life, you know, you don't want to be that shady character in a dark alley that we've seen in movies where you're like, Hey, you want to buy a watch, you know? And to a lot of people, that's kind of what we're doing. We're like going in the middle of Times right. Square with a megaphone where to complete strangers and we're like say, hey, here's what I'm selling. This is what I'm selling. This is what I'm selling. And what do a lot of us do when we see those people in Times Square? We kind of like have a bubble and we walk. It's almost like a force field. We kind of like walk around. There's one or two people that are amazed and they're taking pictures like, wow, we don't get this at home. You know, but other <laughs> than that, like most of us walk around these type of people. Right. And, and it's hard because we're excited. And all of us have been there. We have a friend, a family member. They just went into a new business opportunity or something. They were coached on some marketing training. And what do they do suddenly? They, they went front on social media and Facebook from like posting about their food every day or what they've done yesterday. And we're judging them like we do everybody else. And, you know, but then suddenly they're like, oh my goodness, this thing, this product changed my life yesterday and you need it too. And it's going to change your life. And then suddenly like their feed is just littered with like 30,000 different ways of how this product has changed their life in the last 48 hours. And we just didn't, most of us didn't wake up wanting, needing, feeling the desire to buy that thing. And we, we have to be okay with that. So we need to pull some of the social cues in our life 
from the real world. And we need to overlay it in our online marketing because not everybody today woke up ready, willing, and able to purchase our thing. And here's the thing. We don't want to alienate because 99% of the people that are in our world, especially online, even though they don't want our thing, doesn't necessarily mean they're not the best referral source a future potential opportunity for us. So if we alienate them because we're always like hard selling and like hitting them really hard, right. our messaging is totally off because like we're m- not meeting them. Because what, what do all what do we all do when the messaging is wrong with anything in life? Oh, when we're listening to our favorite radio station and a commercial comes on, we don't connect with, we hit the button and we turn the station. And if we're watching TV, traditional TV, not like Netflix, but when we're watching t- traditional TV and a commercial comes on that we don't resonate with, we, we go channel surfing. We look for the next thing. What do we do in the real world when we get mail that comes in, you know, and, and mm-hmm. we make a couple piles and a lot of people spend money, time, energy, effort to get that message in front of us. And we're not the right person at the right time. So we throw it away. Now, it doesn't mean that that message isn't the right message six months from now. Like that message. So some people that do direct mail, they're slowly dripping over time. And that's really what I would love to see people do is when you do a concept, that's an old concept called drip marketing. It's where you message to people where they are in their journey. And then by the time that they are ready and willing and able to buy, they can't think of anybody else. They would never go into a Facebook group. They would never ask a friend because they already are predisposed. They are, they wake up thinking about you, your product, your service. But we have to drip on them properly so that we own a piece of their mind before they make that decision. And I'm going on a lot, so I don't know if you want. No, no, no. That's really great because, you know, you just got me thinking because first off, like, again, I I love that analogy that you used that, you know, uh, all of a sudden you have this thing, this new product or whatever, and it's changed your life and you want everybody to buy it. I think part of it, too, is isn't it that you have to kind of almost change the perception on how people think of you? So how do you do that? And yeah, then so, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting as well, because if you're leading into something new, I remember back when I was, uh, when I went right out of high school, right into real estate and my mom and parts of my family were already in real estate. So my sphere of influence, like the circle of people that knew who I was, like they already knew my family and they already knew other people that were way more experienced than me. Like I was 18, 19 years old, barely out of high school you know, coming in saying, oh, I can sell your house. I don't own a house yet, but I can sell your house. I'm a better choice (laughs) than everybody else that you know in my family that already has a real estate license. So the excitement is there, which is great, but does it match the level of awareness or the social proof? You know, like it was going to take me a little bit of time. Like, sure, maybe my immediate friends that I went to school with, that they were like fast action takers right out of school, they would buy a house immediately. But most of them were going to, they had years ahead of them before they were ready. So you, I really had to spend time, energy, and effort to up-level my perceived status to the people that knew me. Now, what's interesting, it took a couple of years, and I'm sure certain family members didn't like this, but like I owned a peace of mind of my family members where they didn't go to my mom. They didn't go to my other family members anymore. They actually went to me. And what was really interesting, they saw me in a certain light. This is going to be bad. I'm going to say it in a minute. I never reduced a commission, even for my family. My okay. family paid full commission because I positioned myself that I was the best you know, choice for them. And it only took so many people as far as clients. So it was exclusivity that was there as well. Now, not everybody woke up wanting to buy or sell a house. Not everybody right now woke up wanting our thing. We don't want to alienate people. So how do we, and this is really what we want to get. How many times in your life have you been following somebody that does sell a product or service, but you're not interested in a product or service, but man, do you follow them? You love anything and everything that they talk about. That's what being a follower is about. It's not necessarily like being sold on their product or service. It's like your values are aligned, your beliefs are aligned, you know, what they speak into resonates with you because they're like, they almost like they have a, a video camera in your house and they kind of get you, Right. you know? So right. really what's happening though, is that influencer, that, that, that person, that expert is entering the conversation that you are already having as a consumer. And that's what we want to do as a marketer, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, is we need to understand what the daily life is of our customer, because they're not always going to be a customer. Like the customer moment is like a sliver of time typically, but who are they before that? Because we want to get on their radar before that. So what conversations are they having? What are they thinking, saying, feeling, and doing? 
Now, what's interesting, this is what copywriters use. Thinking, saying, feeling, doing. So this is important. Now, what's also interesting about these three or these four elements that a lot of people don't realize, thinking, saying, feeling, doing, that's also human psychology. That's neurolinguistics. Because in order to have a transformation from being you know, over here and wanting to be into the, the next space in the future, whatever your aspiration or getting away from pain is, you would think, say, feel, and do something different. Okay. So when you speak into these conversations, when you have and you can talk into the life or the lifestyle or the pain or you know, the, the trauma or the struggle that somebody is having, they're going to be like, oh my goodness, you get me. You know what's going on in my house. You know what I say to myself. You know what I'm thinking in the morning when I'm struggling with that topic. And on the other end, why do they buy our product or service? Because they want the aspirational side. They want to move away from that struggle, away from that pain. Mm -hmm. They want what the future potential can be. So they would, if they had that transformation from our product or service, they would think, say, feel, and do completely different things. So again, this is based on human psychology. This is human, this is therapy. This is neurolinguistics. But that's how we bring it in. That's where the messaging comes. If you want to have perfect messaging, don't come up with a messaging. Talk to the people you're serving and what are they already saying? Use their words, their phrases, their sentences. That'll be your headlines. That'll be your body copy. That'll be your call to actions. That'll be your lead magnets. That'll be your offers. That'll be your podcast episodes. That'll be everything. You really don't have to think about it because it's already there for you. I love that. That's almost like a mic drop right then and there. <laughs> that is so good. I think I'm going to re-listen to this portion of the interview multiple times. Um, so I want to switch um, over to Facebook. Yeah. So I have to say, why on earth does Facebook change so much? I was in the Facebook manager of Facebook ads um, yesterday. It's different. It's like every time I go in there, it's completely different, um, which I think just kind of creates a challenge for everyone. So what can we do, I guess, um, so that we don't make, I would say, like almost common errors in Facebook? Yeah. So when you're doing Facebook ads or any type of advertising, it actually should be the last step that you do in your marketing process. And, and what I mean by that is that ads will only amplify what's right or wrong with your offer, with your messaging, and with your audience selection. It won't fix your funnel. It won't fix any issues that you have. And the biggest mistake that we see a lot of people making is that they are like, oh, I'm not getting people in my lead magnet. I'm not getting people in my webinar. I'm not getting people into my offer, my paid offer. So I'll put ads behind it. And it's like, oh, so now you're putting bad money. Be and, and I'm okay with that, but PayPal me the money, you know, because you're just going to give it to Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> and he doesn't necessarily need it. And I'll gladly give you my PayPal address if you just want to donate money out to the world. <laughs> You know, it's, it's so, so really what we have to do is understand is that the moment that you're actually touching the ads manager, you should already be very clear with a tested offer. You mm -hmm. should already be very clear with all the assets that you would have in that ad. You should not, where we see a lot of people make a mistake is they're actually staring at the, the screen and the ads manager and they're coming up with the answers and they're trying to fill in the blanks as they're doing oh, wow. it. And you should actually have all this predetermined before you touch it. Like if you went to an ad agency, they're not going to go, uh, random client. Okay. Let's go in the, this magazine today. And, and, uh, okay. Now well, what ad should we play since we're inside here? And, uh, what the, should the copies? No, they have a strategy. They have a plan. They know who they're targeting very clearly before they submit the ad. They know what the messaging is. What's the purpose? What's the reason? What's the why? Now for some of us, if we're not launching or directly selling something, we're just trying to gather people. What does the people that we're approaching, what would make them socially raise their hand and maybe opt into an email list or have them join a certain Facebook group or listen to your podcast? Like what would be the topic that would resonate with them? That way, all the people that are not ideal clients would like totally like block it out and ignore it. And all the people that are the right people would be like, hey, that's me. I want that. I want to consume that. Because what we want to do is we want to tune in ahead of time organically like what's the right messaging? What's the right offer? 
so that when we, we know what works, because we're going to do testing and everything be beforehand, then once you have it tuned in, then you take it into an ad. And then you already know the messaging ahead of time. You already know what the call to action is. You already know the purpose and the reason, like at what stage somebody's at them in your world that they would receive this ad. Because a lot of us are, you know, it's that stranger danger moment I talked about, or you hear a lot of marketers, they'll, they'll do the whole, the marriage proposal thing. Like you take somebody out on the first date and you're like, hi, my name is, oh, by the way, you want to marry me? You know, it's kind of like, and that's what we're doing to a lot of our potential clients. And it's like, you don't know them. You know, there's a courting process. There's communication. There's two-way communication. Is this the right fit? Is this for me? You know, does this make sense? Do I want to take a step forward? Do I even want a second date? let alone, you know, long-term commitment. And a lot of us mess up because we're just, we're anxious. We're that teenager, <laughs> you know, that uh, just can't wait for the second date, you know? So what we, what we really need to do is if you could take a time now, we normally do what's called wireframing. This is a little bit more advanced, but just to give you a simple idea is old school, get a sheet of paper and just sketch out just like, what would that ad say? Like, like what stage is that potential client in? Like, are you just trying to get new people in your world and you're not necessarily selling them something, but you want to like build your email list or maybe you're, you're following right now. What would your person, what, what are they thinking, saying, feeling, and doing? And when you know that, it's like, what would, if you were in that state and you were that person, what would you want to see in your newsfeed? Like, what would be the thing that would stop you from scrolling? That would like, you're scrolling, judging your friends, seeing what they did yesterday, you got opinions. And then suddenly, oh, this popped in front of you and it just, hit you like right between the eyes. And it's like, but you had to put yourself in that person's state because a lot of us that are the expert, we don't live this reality. We don't live the reality that the people we're con that we're attracting as a consumer because we're at a different stage. That's why they come to us. So if you think about it, what we're doing is the messaging. We should write at that out ahead of time. Like what's a couple, you know, in, you know, headlines that potentially will work. What's some body copy that would like pull in, could it be a story base where I can actually almost like a movie script go in to that person's life and kind of spell out like probably what they're going through. And that's why they would be a perfect person in my world because I know I get them. And again, you're not making up these words. You see it in Facebook groups. You see them comment on pages. You see them random about it on their mm -hmm. social media accounts. You know, you see it, you see it at the grocery store, people shouting out or whatever, like there, you just see it in different spaces in the real world, in the wild. And you just bring that copy in. We don't have to be smarter. Mm -hmm. We can actually just use the, you know, because again, how many of us have been in a, we see a Facebook ad that is just so perfectly aligned. It says exactly what it needed to say the day that we need to see it. And we didn't even need to be nurtured. We're like, I'm buying that. Like that, that hits my pain point and that's making the right promise. And it's because this, the marketer didn't try to get smarter than us. They went into our conversation. They know what our struggle or pain is. They know what our aspirations are, what we desire to have. And they put our own words, our own language, our own story, our own lives in the copy. And it pulls you right in. But I know you had, you started this question differently. So I just want to come back to that full circle here. Be okay as an entrepreneur and embrace that things are going to evolve and change. That, you know, so don't allow something like an interface on Facebook to overwhelm you. It's the difference on like buying a Mustang back in 1969. That was my first car, 69 Mach 1 Mustang <laughs> when I was a kid and getting into like the new e-Mustang or whatever it is. Like I'd be looking around saying, where's the gas tank? Oh, this one doesn't have a gas tank. You know, and it's like, oh, well, it's going to start. It has wheels. It's going to drive me somewhere. I'm going to put it in gear. You know, but it might be in a different spot. A little different. You know, That's right. You know, Facebook's it, always yeah. going to be changing for sure. Yeah. So the core elements are there. Just don't get overwhelmed with the technical mm -hmm. elements. And the really cool thing, Facebook is is like when you go in the ads manager, it's like going into the cockpit of a of an airplane. You see all these buttons and knobs and everything like that. But really, we just us us as small business owners, it's like tiny tikes. We only need like seven or eight different things that are in there. We don't need the entire mm -hmm. instrument panel. That's all made for agencies, made for big mega mil million dollar plus companies that do other elements and things. We don't need all the extra stuff. So even though you see all of that, just understand there's a smaller group of things you just need to focus on. And if it gets moved around, just take the extra 10 minutes the first time, find a new spot. And as an entrepreneur, you're resilient. 
Like that's the whole idea of us not conforming is that we're willing to do things other people aren't, which means that we have to be adaptable. We have to be adaptable to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I kind of want to dig into something that you brought up because it sounds like to me that there is a life cycle for the customer Mm. and you almost need to know where they are in that life cycle relative to what it is that you do. Yeah. Can you now, talk is, a little bit more about that? Like when they go from like, they have no idea who you are, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, to maybe eventually buying from you. And then what do you do even after that? Yeah. So we always have to put ourselves in first person to truly understand this is that I'm, I'm out of shape. I'm just going to call myself out because health and, and, and weight things are always tricky for people to talk about. So I'm going to make it in first person so it doesn't offend anybody. I know I need to lose weight, but man, that Reese cup, that was really good. I had a bad habit. I ate that Reese cup. I should not have done that. You know? And if there was an ad today that was like, Oh, weight loss, blah, 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 blah. I was like, man, I ate that Reese cup. That was my decision. You know? Um, like there was a different product service taking me in the wrong direction versus me buying a product or service that would take me in the right direction. So even if it's a product or service that your person needs, it doesn't necessarily mean that they want it. And, you know, so we have to always keep that in the back of our mind that even people that need what we give, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is significant to their beliefs, their values, their, their journey. Now, and I say that because, again, a lot of people make a mistake and be like, oh, I have, you know, 100 people on my email list. That's 100 buyers. And it's like, well, yeah, probably a certain percentage of them are ready, willing and able to purchase some of them just might love you or love the topic that you're talking about, and they might not ever be a buyer. You know, even if they need it, they might just not ever get around to it. And all of us are guilty. Uh, we make decisions that we should be making, and we our habits and our beliefs and our values are, are out of whack with that. And that's just who we are as human beings. Now, a lot of us, this is getting a little bit more advanced, uh, but I'm going to try to put it, give one or two examples uh, that are very obvious time-based, but a lot of us don't think of the natural buyer's journey in a different context. And that's where the, the, the person that's going through this pain or struggle, they themselves, there's a moment in time where they enter the realm of where your product or service is relevant. And there's a certain point where it becomes irrelevant again. Now, some of us deal in topics like health or relationships. Well, if somebody had a bad relationship six months ago and they opted into your thing, but they reconciled and they're happy right now, they might still be on your email list, but they're not in a time and space where they're looking to pay for a solution. Right. Now, now somebody that just got it, received an engagement ring today is now instantaneously because of a life event has an entire new buyer's journey of a whole bunch of products and services that lay ahead of them than they were yesterday. So some of us have a life event, maybe a ring or a, a wedding, a baby, a, you know, a, a, a senior child that moves out of the house when they graduated high school and went to college, and now they're an empty nester. Some of us just had, a, now this is on the good side of life and also on the, on the down side. So in real estate, it was always, okay, somebody got a new job, buy a house. Somebody just expanded in their family, child, marriage, whatever, relationship, to income house, okay, different house, okay? Then it's like, okay, mo moved up, you know, getting, you know, the, making, got a raise again, getting the bigger house, all those things, like that progression. But then there's the slide on the other side, which is empty nester, divorce, bankruptcy, you know, loss of job, death. There's all the other things that are life events that causes people. Some of us that deal in the health sector your person might not exist until they got a diagnosis of something. Mm -hmm. Your person might not exist in, until they just got out of the hospital, or maybe they they're going through physical therapy right now or, or something just happened where two weeks ago, they were not your client. They were not looking and Googling your thing, but because of a life event that happens, suddenly it's relevant. You know, if you, if you were an interior designer, somebody that just bought a house today might now be looking at your stuff, but the day before today, they might not have been relevant whatsoever. You know, there, so some of us have a life cycle, a window of time where somebody's relevant. And what's interesting though, is some of us 
are like the equivalent of like a wedding planner that got a whole bunch of leads from a wedding show 10 years ago. And they're still emailing these people as if like they didn't get married. Oh, wow. Right. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, Oh, this is a big email list. All these people, I don't know why they don't buy. And it's like, well, some of those emails are fake that they created for the wedding like six years ago. <laughs> yeah. Just because they're still on your email list doesn't necessarily make them the right person, you know? And, and a lot of us need to remember that. Now this also, just so you know, this also comes into play when it comes to Facebook ads, because two years ago, you or I could have clicked on a website or on a link and we got flagged on our, on our account that we had a certain interest, that we were interested in a certain topic. Now that tag doesn't disappear. So somebody could be advertising to us today and it's something that's not relevant whatsoever to us, but it's because we're lumped in a group. Perfect example is uh, two years ago, one of our uh, good friends uh, was pregnant and she, they, you know, they were having their first child. And Melissa went on and looked at the, the baby uh, registry in order to, to get something for, you know, for their little event. And then suddenly Melissa was targeted for a whole bunch of ads for expecting mothers. Now, so that's why sometimes it's always interesting. Like if you click on one thing, all of a sudden you're going to get a whole bunch of other ads that are related yeah. to that one topic. Exactly. Because what you clicked on, it's labeled. It could be a website like mm -hmm. Bye Bye Baby or, you know, something or, or, you know, registry or something. And Facebook knows that. So they then, you then become part of a lookalike audience, you know, or you might have consumed a video. One day you're watching puppy videos, even though you're a cat person, it was a really cute puppy video. Somebody sent you, it was on a puppy you know, Facebook page, and then suddenly you're getting advertising for puppy classes and puppy treat, you know, puppy treats and stuff like that. And you're like, I'm a cat owner. This doesn't make sense. So there, we had to be careful of this because these are, these are better signals than being blind, but it's not an absolute, it's not a guarantee. The thousand I'm people that say, saw your ad How do you yesterday. navigate through that then if you are going to be doing an ad? How do you navigate? Or you just know that there's going to be some audience members that are just not the right ones for you? Yeah. Well, what we want to do is picking on like the cat owner versus dog owner, you can create certain mechanisms that will get the right people to raise their hand ahead of time. So instead of waiting until you're trying to make a sale in advance, I, I look at it more and call it more like a snowball effect, or rather have more of the right people ahead of time. So we pre-fill or pre-stock our pond in advance of a launch. So we purposely do ads that speak into very specific topics that only the people that resonate with our offer would be interested in. Okay. So think of it more like a spokes to a wheel. Okay. So if the offer, like what we're selling is in the center, what are the extreme pain points of the topics? And that's based on market research that you do out in the world. Like what are the, the topics that people actually resonate with? And then I test those a month or two ahead of time, each of those topics we go around a topic and also around a lead magnet for that topic. So then when I'm going in advertising, I'm only advertising to people that have socially signaled that they're interested okay. in those things versus the junk versus the rest. It's just what happens most of the time. People don't pre pre-stock their pond. They don't dig their well before they're thirsty. So what happens is they're in that scarcity mindset. You know, they, they need to sell something today and make money today. So they're doing a shotgun approach. It's just megaphone in Times Square screaming to a bunch of people and not everybody there is relevant. So they end up not getting the results that they want because they're trying to do a fire sale at the 11th hour to mm -hmm. bring people in. But the best buyer to have is a predisposed buyer. People that are like, know, and trust you before they need your product or service. That's where you have longevity in a business. Because otherwise, if you're always selling into the 11th hour, like you need somebody to convert today, and if you stopped your ads today, you would have like no future opportunity coming in. You're only two steps away from being out of business at all times. You just need the ads not to work one particular week and you're upside down. You're gone. Like no matter how good it's been, if you're, if you're at the whim of an algorithm or how an ad's performing in this moment, that's not a good safe place to be. And that's where most people sit is in, in that space. The 11th hour needs you to buy right now. And if anything shifts or changes, then it's a magical thing when you have the right people in your email list, because you can mm -hmm. just create an offer this morning that you know right. is aligned because you know your people and you can just push send 
And then suddenly your bank account fills up because it was, you already know it was aligned based on their conversations. Right. I love what you said about pre-stocking the pond. Can you give us like some examples of that? Because I love that concept and it's actually a really great analogy as well. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is where we live uh, all the time. Cause, and this came from, from me when, when I went right out of high school uh, in 92, right into to real estate, you know, I sold 23 homes my first year, made a little over $48,000, uh, 18, 19 years old. And then I never made less than six figures a year after that. And, um, and really what it came down to this predisposed buyer in this, because if you think about it with real estate, not everybody's waking up every day. It's not like a tube of toothpaste. You ran out today and you're going to go buy some more right. like seven, 10 years, people maybe make a move. So there's a long runway there. So the whole idea is, and this is old school branding and marketing. This is going back, you know, cause when you, when you're a category, you know, leader, your name of your brand typically owns the category. So a lot of us don't think about marketing in that way these days, but you want to have a predisposed buyer. So if you think about it, like Kleenex is what we say for tissues all the time. Well, Kleenex actually is a brand name. It's not actually a product. It's a brand name. So what do you think Scotty feels like when people ask for a Kleenex? You know, it's like, you know, they're just selling, you know, back in the day when it used to be Xerox. Well, it's like, well, sharp copiers probably were not happy that somebody said, hey, can you make me a Xerox of that? Right. You know, we don't say these words as much these days, but the whole idea is, can we own a piece of the mind of the consumer for what we do for a living, our product or service? That way we become top of mind because not only do we get them as a, a client, we also get most of the referrals and the recommendations. You know, you're doing this right when you are not in the real room, real world room, or you're not in the online room, which is like a Facebook group and your name is being tagged. Your name is being said while you're not in the room for right. whatever your category is. So when it comes to pre-stocking your pond, what I'm doing is I, I'm looking at, um, you know, we call it an offer wheel. So we look at the, the hub of the wheel in the center and we have the spokes and we look at the big main topics. Now, if we sell a course, like we have a course on Facebook ads. So on that, we look at it like, okay, copywriting was one of those lines. Okay. Understanding, you know, what, you know, the, the buyer's journey and the messaging is another line, you know, how to, you know, actually go into Facebook ads itself, into the ads manager and, and actually go in and, and plug in everything. That's another line. So we look at all the different individual lines. And then what we look at and we're like, okay, what conversation can we have around copywriting as an example? Because that would be one of the spokes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, well, if we break down copywriting, okay, that could be the offer page. Well, let's stick with the ads right now. Okay. So that's zooming in one particular topic in copywriting is the ads themselves. Then it's like, okay, well, with the ads, there's different elements of the ad. There's the image or the video, like that has copy elements to it. There's the actual headline that grips and grabs attention and pulls people mm -hmm. in. There's the body copy. And there's the call to action. Well, right there, that's five pieces of content that I could put out in one, one of those can be a social media post, or it could lead to, you know, just one element could lead to a lead magnet, right. you know, because it all drives copywriting, which is what people want to know what to say in their ads. So now my content publicly is relevant to what my offer is. So if anybody opts in on something that I put in that line, they would be perfectly aligned because it's not the average person that's on social media. They, if they're opting in on something that's about headlines or about call to actions or body copy you know, of a Facebook ad, they're definitely going to be aligned to a Facebook ad course later on. You know, So we're pre-stocking our pond. We're getting people following us. We're getting video views. We're getting opt-ins within the topic that is actually part of our offer. And, and we're doing that based on, again, those spokes. Like, what are the things? Because it's like putting the right bait out and putting it out into the water and a different piece of bait will pull a different piece of right. you know, catch. So, you know, we have to be very more intentional with what we throw out into the world. I want to thank you, Paul. I mean, you gave us so much value. I adore you and your wife, Melissa, and everyone. Um, if you haven't checked out the adaptive method, please go ahead and check that out. And again, thank you, Paul, because I love just listening to you. I always, every time I talk to you, I always learn so much. It has been an honor and privilege. Thank you for having me on.